So our, our next speaker uh, is another member of the, the BJD team. Uh, Martab Samimi uh, is a, a remarkable lady. Uh, she uh, was uh, born in Iran, uh, moved to France uh, when only very little. Uh, she undertook her medical studies at the University of Tours. And uh, then she became a dermatologist and uh, knew that she was uh, going to be an academic dermatologist, I think, from very early on in her career. And she's done some groundbreaking research into uh, polyoma viruses and her focus on Merkel cell carcinoma. And uh, she's been working within uh, the immunology research unit in, in Nantes uh, as part of that. She um, uh, is a full professor of dermatology uh, and uh, really, you know, a, a fitting um, uh, achievement at, uh, given the work she's, she's done in this field. So, uh, Martab, it's a great pleasure to have you on the BGD team and to uh, invite you to speak this afternoon. Thank you, really thank you for the nice introduction. And thank you for having inviting me. It's the first time I attend this Congress and I'm really having a good time. It's really fantastic and as I told you, the uh, piano recital by Professor Williams this morning was the most amazing thing I ever saw in a medical conference. So again, thank you for having invited me. So talking about MCC, um, usually uh, MCC uh, is presented uh, as such a, in, in this kind of nodule on the sun exposed skin of an elderly patient. But it can have many various aspects. It can be a subcutaneous lesion, it can be an uh, ulcerated tumor, and uh, anyway, you see that it's malignant and you know that you have to perform a biopsy, but you hardly ever think it's an MCC before you receive the pathology report. So why don't we think about MCC? Because it's very rare, and I don't know how many MCCs you see, but most dermatologists, they only see a few cases in their career. And if you look at the incidence here in Europe, you see that uh, it's between one, maybe two or three cases per million habitants per year. However, the incidence is increasing. You can see that it obviously increases in the United States and in Australia, and it also increases slightly in Europe. And you can see here in the UK and in France, we have rather uh, similar incidence rates of MCC. So the question is, why uh, does such a rare cancer uh, raise so much attention? Um, it's because the, the story is really, really fascinating. Um, if you look at the story of MCC, it had been described less than 50 years ago by Dr. Tucker, who was a pathologist at the Mount Sinai Hospital. And um, basically, no one cared about MCC. We only knew that it looked like the Merkur cells of the skin. So we thought that it just derived from the Merkur cells of the skin, and it was over. And it was until um, it was shown that the incidence of MCC was increased in patients with immunosuppression, a tenfold increase in patients with AIDS. So the question was, is there an infectious agent that could account for this. And there were many attempts to identify this infectious agent and with candidates being EBV, CMV, herpes virus or Kaposi virus and so on. But all of these attempts had failed. And it was really recently, 10 years ago, when Yuang Chang and Patrick Moore from Pittsburgh identified that in fact it was a polyomavirus that was integrated in the genoma of these cancer cells. And this was a newly described uh, virus, so they, uh, of course, called it the Merkel cell polyomavirus. And this finding, again, raised new controversies because this virus then was found to be ubiquitous. That means that if we do a um, swab in the skin of people here in the audience, 50% of us will carry the DNA of the Merkel cell polyomavirus on our skin. And uh, we won't have uh, all of us an MCC. I hope nobody here will have an MCC in the future. So why does it happen like this? Uh, the Merkel cell polyomavirus infects the majority of us during childhood, and it, stage in a, it, it stays in a latent stage somewhere in the body during life. But when you get old or immunosuppressed or both, 
the virus starts to replicate and replicate and replicate, and one day, by bad chance, it will integrate into the genome of a cell. And again, by bad chance, it will acquire mutation that will uh, make the T antigens, which are the anchor proteins of the protein, to be overexpressed, and they are able to transform the cell. And we know that um, nearly 80% of MCCs will have this virus signature, that what we call the viral-positive MCCs. And what's curious is that we have 20% of MCCs that do not have the virus. But we, want, we don't know if these are two different mechanisms or if at one stage this subset had the virus and got rid of the virus, I don't need you anymore, I can have my own life, and then uh, created a new subset. What we know is that this subset of MCCs have a high uh, number of mutations, which are UV-induced mutations, but uh, we don't know how it happens, where it happens, and so on. Uh, we don't even know what is the cell of origin of Merkel cell carcinoma. And uh, we don't think anymore that th this derives from the Merkel cells of the skin, because the Merkel cells of the skin, they are too much differentiated, and they cannot be transformed anymore. So there are many other hypotheses, and it's a great field of research currently. And one hypothesis is that there is an epithelial cell that would be the progenitor of the Merkel cells in a normal uh, setting, and if transformed by the Merkel cell polyamide virus, this could lead to the Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, another hypothesis is that it's a cell in the dermis, a fibroblast or a stem cell in the dermis. And the last hypothesis is uh, the one by uh, Dr. Axel Zurosen from Maastricht, is that a pre-pro B cell would circulate and come to the skin and get transformed by the Merkel cell polyomavirus. And I must admit that I don't really believe in this hypothesis, but uh, we are friends, so I mm -hmm. present the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to practical thing, how to make the diagnosis. So you have performed the biopsy, and there are two key markers to search. Most of MCCs uh, will express the cytokeratin 20, and neuroendocrine markers such as chromogranin A or synaptophysin. But there are some diagnostic pitfalls, and you have to be aware of this. Um, you would see these two close clinical pictures here. These two patients have a cytokeratin 20 negative cancer. Uh, they both express neuroendocrine markers, but uh, as you can see, this one uh, has a positive staining with TTF1, and these are cutaneous metastases from a small cell lung cancer, and this one is TTF1 negative, and this is an MCC. So you need additional markers to really make the accurate diagnosis of MCC. So after you made the diagnosis, you have to do the workup. So as you know, it's a very aggressive cancer, so we do, for all of our patients, a TEP CT scan, which is the most sensitive uh, exam for detecting metastases. But even if the TEP CT scan is normal, you still have to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And it was shown that it detects micrometastasis in about one third of patients. As in, the, as in melanoma, we know that this is a prognostic marker, but we don't know if completing the uh, biopsy with a complete lymph node dissection really impacts on the outcome of patients, and we really need randomized trials to assess this issue. When you have all this data, you can classify the patients according to the staging. It had been updated a few years ago. I won't go into details. You can find it everywhere. Just wanted to show you uh, the five-year survival. That is very, very poor. As long as you have a stage 2A, which means a tumor which is larger than two centimeters, you only have a 50% chance of being alive at five years. So this also underlines that it is still a very, very uh, bad cancer with a bad prognosis. So we have to uh, diagnose these tumors at an early stage and to do a standard treatment in these early stages. 
So how do we treat patients at early stages? Um, here you see a patient that I saw when I was a resident that was years and years uh, before. And in these older times, we used to do wide, wide margins. That was something we discussed yesterday during the plenary, plenary session. The wider is bigger. And it took months for this patient to heal from this surgery. And obviously, we don't do that anymore. Now uh, we do narrow margins, one to two centimeter margins, but for almost all of our patients, we do an adjuvant radiation therapy of the primary tuber bed. And again, we don't have any prospective randomized trial to prove this, but most retrospective studies suggest that this kind of radiation therapy improves local control and maybe also improves the survival of the patients. Regarding radiation therapy of the lymph nodes, the benefit is unclear. So we only do this for patients who are uh, really at high risk of recurrence. But definitely, radiation therapy is very efficient and very useful in MCC. Look at this patient here. This lady came to us with this rapidly growing mass of the nose and uh, we couldn't do any surgery. It was during Christmas holidays, so uh, it was a very sad story. She was really upset. So we just did uh, radiation therapy. You can see here after three weeks, and you can see here after eight weeks, she was free of disease, and she still is free of disease. So radiation therapy works very well in Merkel cell carcinoma. And uh, I was really sad to learn that this wonderful randomized trial that was planned in the UK uh, to compare surgery and radiation therapy in MCC had to be stopped because of many uh, recruitment failure and so on. So we really needed this trial to, to determine what should be the standard of care in MCC. Um, let's see this other patient here. She was an old lady with an Alzheimer's disease. Uh, she had this MCC and she didn't want any treatments. So we tried to negotiate with her and we decided to do a minimal surgery, which means with narrow margins, two millimeter, three millimeter margins. And this was the worst idea ever because she rapidly recurred very badly and she had lymph node meds. So uh, we did a palliative uh, radiation therapy and this worked well, but she already had lymph node metastases and at the end she had distant metastases and she died. So uh, the minimal surgery with no radiation therapy is the worst idea in MCC. You have to do a rather wide surgery uh, or to combine surgery or radiation therapy or radiation therapy alone. So look at the guidelines. The guidelines here, American and European guidelines say nearly the same. In the patient who don't have uh, lymph nodes, you have to do the surgery of the primary tumor and the sentinel lymph node biopsy in the same time, and if positive, complete with the lymph node dissection. The radiation therapy of the primary tumor bed is done for almost all patients. We do it for all of our patients. And uh, for the lymph node area, it's for patients who have a high risk of recurrence. And when your patient has uh, obvious lymph node meds, uh, at initial baseline, you do the surgery of the tumor and of course the lymph node dissection and for the radiation therapy is the same. Um, there is no adjuvant chemotherapy in this stage. Uh, it's not uh, beneficial and it's toxic. And you have to closely monitor these patients because 40-50% uh, of them will recur and most of these recurrences, they will occur rapidly during the two, three first years after treatment. So you uh, monitor them as in melanoma with physical examination, ultrasonography, and so on. But in MCC, we also have useful biomarkers that I will show you right now. These biomarkers are antibodies in the blood that are directed against the Merkel cell poliomavirus T antigens, which are the oncoproteins of the virus. And these antibodies are very specific to MCC patients. Healthy people do not have such antibodies. And how it works, um, here you have a patient with an MCC. At the baseline, he has 
uh, detectable uh, antibodies, but when he's treated, the antibodies will drop and become negative. This patient is in remission. Um, here you can see another patient, he's treated, the antibodies will decrease, and when you monitor the antibodies, you see that they rise again. And here you do a TEP CT scan, and you see that there is a MET. So you start immunotherapy. And uh, these antibodies, they really track disease burden, and we do it in our lab in France, in Tours. Uh, it's available as a send-out test across Europe. We do it for free, so if you want to monitor your patients with this test, you can uh, check our website. And it was also uh, validated by the U.S. Uh, cohort in a larger scale. They um, monitor the patients with the T-antigen antibodies. Here, more than 200 patients. And you can see that patients that have decreasing titers, they do not recur. And patients who have increasing antibody titers do recur. And these are very impressive results for a predictive test, huh? nearly 100% for each situation. So the monitoring of MCC with such tests has been included in the uh, US guidelines last year. So now we have uh, started an international collaboration to uh, evaluate this kind of monitoring in patients and to elaborate guidelines and also to compare with other biomarkers. This is called the COMET group. And at the European level, we also have this project um, to monitor uh, MCC patients from Europe with this kind of biomarkers and we don't have the funding yet, it was submitted to the EADV, so if someone from the scientific committee is in the audience, or if you know someone who is in the audience, just uh, think of the summertime project. And we don't have any investigator from UK, but uh, if you want to join, please feel free to send me an email. Um, so let's move on to therapies uh, for advanced uh, cases. Here you have this patient who had uh, lymph node meds, and we treated him with chemo and with radiation therapy, and you can see that it really worked. He's free of disease. But he recurred very rapidly, and this shows that chemotherapies in MCC do work, but the chemo resistance, it arrives very rapidly. And in a second line setting, it does not work. So we really needed systemic therapies for this patient at advanced stages. So uh, what about targeted therapies? You know that, for instance, BRAF mutated melanoma are very efficiently treated with BRAF inhibitors or MAC inhibitors. But in MCC, we do not have this chance because um, in MCC, you don't have any redundant mutation, hotspot mutation, or pathway to target. The spectrum of mutation is very heterogeneous among patients. So you have individual case reports that show that when you treat someone with a targeted inhibitor here is a second inhibitor, you can have a response. But when you do the trials, these are often disappointing. So targeted therapies do not work very well. Um, fortunately, we have the immunotherapies, and we already knew that the immune system was very important in MCC, because immunosuppressed have more MCCs, because immunosuppressed die rapidly from their MCC, and we also knew that uh, tumor, the, 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 the an MCC that is infiltrated with CD8 T cells was associated with a better outcome. But the problem is that MCCs are able to escape the immune response. And there are many mechanisms. I won't really go into details, but the tumoral cells are able to uh, downregulate their MHC and become invisible to the immune system. They are able to exclude T cells, to exclude NK cells. And uh, the T cells in the microenvironment are exhausted. You are familiar with this concept. They express PD-1, they express TIN-3, so they cannot work properly. So the first strategy was to uh, target the PD-1, pd one axis, as uh, you know uh, from melanoma. And we have now a few trials uh, with this kind of molecules in metastatic MCCs. Uh, you see that uh, these are small cohorts, uncontrolled uh, studies, because it's such a rare cancer, you can't do large randomized controlled trials as we have in melanoma. But you can see that in, um, sorry, in the first line setting, 
the immune checkpoint inhibitors um, work in 60% of patients nearly. And what is important that is these responses are maintained over time, what we didn't see with uh, the chemo. And in a second line setting, you have one third of patients who will respond, and again, most of these responses are maintained over time. So now these uh, checkpoint inhibitors are considered as a standard of care in patients with advanced disease, and the reimbursement varies across countries. For instance, in France, we only have avelumab reimbursed in a second line setting after failure of a chemo. So what to do for patients who do not respond to immunotherapies, and that's the future of treatments, all the trials that are uh, currently going on. Uh, so if you want to find the therapies, you have to uh, remember the immune evasion mechanism we described previously. So uh, making the uh, cancer more visible to the immune system, and there are many strategies. You can do radiation therapy, TVEC, delivery of cytokines, of interferon, and so on. Uh, there are a next generation of checkpoint inhibitors that can target LAG3, TIM3, and so on. There are also new antibodies that stimulate T cells by activating the signal uh, on the T cells. And you also have what we call cell therapies, that is infusion of immune cells that can be either infusion of NK cells or infusion of T cells that specifically recognize the cancer. These are adoptive T cell therapies. And all these uh, therapies are under investigation by now, either alone or either combined together. So to uh, synthesize, um, there have been huge advances in understanding and in treating MCCs, but there are many things we still don't know. And we still don't know how it starts at the beginning, what's the cell of origin. We don't know how it can lead to either a positive, very positive, or a very negative MCC. Are there two separate things or the same thing at the beginning? We don't know. We don't have any randomized trial to define the best standard of care for early stages. Should we do sentinel lymph node biopsy? Should we do surgery and radiation therapy or both? We don't know. Uh, there are trials uh, currently to investigate immunotherapies in the adjuvant setting. For advanced stages, immunotherapy are a standard of care now, and uh, I showed you the different strategies that are investigated for other patients. So um, my acknowledgements, I, I needed a bigger slide for all my acknowledgements. So I wanted to thank my clinical team. It's in the dermatology departments of Tours in France, the pathology team, uh, my research lab, our collaboration uh, on Merkel cell carcinoma. And of course, I wanted to thank warmly the BGD team, uh, Alex, for having uh, inviting me to join the team a few years ago and it's a very uh, exciting, amazing experience. And this was the meeting in Birmingham, and here the meeting in Liverpool a few days ago with John, who is the new editor now. So we have a Twitter account, so please follow us on Twitter. Thank you. Oh, my mug. Thank you. Really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much.